Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Hey, do not forget, July 9 through 11, Ardmore, Oklahoma Convention Center, Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020. Our theme this year is the Book of Revelation. We have a great lineup of speakers. It's going to be a fantastic time of fellowship. And yes, for those of, of you who have already inquired, uh, Lord willing, nothing happens uh, if we're able to pay for it. In other words, <laughs> uh, we, will, we will offer it live stream. And so you'll be able to take advantage of it. You know, it's been absolutely remarkable how, how many people we have had watching the live stream in, in the past. I mean, it has just been fantastic. So uh, if you can't be here, all right, we want you to be here. You want to be here. But if you can't, uh, the live stream is the next best thing. And so we, we offer that as a free service. Obviously, uh, we welcome, we invite gifts, uh, you know, uh, contributions to help us pay for this. We have to bring someone in, uh, pay all of their expenses and what have you. But we do offer it as free if you cannot pay for it. But we want you here, all right? Such a fantastic time of fellowship, a fantastic time of learning. You do not want to miss it. Preterist Pilgrim Weekend 2020, Ardmore, Oklahoma, Ardmore, Oklahoma Convention Center. If you want any details on it, just contact me and I'll give you all the details uh, that I can. We all get it. We're already getting registrations in, all right? People are already contacting us saying, our reservations are already made. We are coming. Try to be one of them, okay? All right. Well, we, we've been examining the language of Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, <clears throat> uh, in, in which Jesus said, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn. I have demonstrated to you that the prophetic background is Zechariah chapters 12 through 14. You know, even <laughs> uh, just over the last two days, I've had someone say, Preston, you're just flat wrong because Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 was fulfilled at the cross, according to John chapter 19. Well, it's interesting that this individual completely ignored, completely ignored the fact that I pointed out that John quoted Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 to describe Jesus' time on the cross. However, this individual also completely ignored the fact that Zechariah chapter 12 did not reach its final consummative uh, fulfillment at the cross because, here's the reason, Zechariah chapter 13 continues in describing the day of mourning and says, in that day, two-thirds of the people shall perish out of the land, and the Lord shall bring one-third, a remnant that is, purified by fire. So, to this individual who challenged the idea that Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 was actually referring to the time of judgment on Jerusalem, they conveniently overlook or ignore the fact that it was in that day in which they would look upon him whom they had pierced, in that day that they would mourn for uh, one as of an only begotten son, in that day that, the, that they would look upon him whom they had pierced, it was in that day <clears throat> two-thirds of the people would perish out of the land. Well, all we have to do is ask, did two-thirds of the people perish out of the land at the time of the cross? Pretty clearly not. So moving on from that, to examine some, some of the rest of the language of Matthew chapter 24, 30 and 31. <coughs> You know, for years and years and years, I had, uh, I had lots of questions. First of all, I began my eschatological journey believing that Matthew chapter 24, 30 to 31, definitely applied to the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. After all, Matthew 24 verse 34 says, Verily I say unto you, which is the strongest way of Jesus affirming that what he is about to say cannot fail cannot fail. 
Verily I say unto you, this generation will by no means, and the Greek expression that he uses there is extremely powerful, will by no means pass until all of these things are fulfilled. Jesus did not say until some of these things are fulfilled, until a few of these things are fulfilled. He said until all of these things are fulfilled. So, I grew up understanding that even if I did not understand all of the ins and the outs of verse 29 to 31, I knew when it occurred. I understood that all of the attempts to destroy the meaning of this generation by saying, well, this generation means the race, uh, this race of people, i.e. the Jews. I understood that was untenable. I understood that every attempt to negate and to destroy that term, this generation simply does not work. So now we've got a new definition of that. Generation means ba making babies. And so, supposedly, Jesus was saying, hey, listen, folks, uh, <clears throat> making babies will by no means cease until all of these things are fulfilled. Oh, my goodness. The desperation of some people. It, 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 utter, absolute, 100% desperation. Jesus had lots and lots and lots of words at his disposal, at his fingertip, at his tongue tip, so to speak, to say men and women will not, have, will not stop having babies until all of these things come to pass. But that obviously is not what he said. And you know, Greek scholars, men who are greater by far Greek scholars, that those who are making this claim absolutely, utterly reject it. They know that the term, this generation, is a temporal statement. Okay. <clears throat> so, I grew up understanding that somehow, some way, even if I did not fully grasp how, Matthew 24, 29 to 31, had to have occurred in that generation. It was a spiritual coming of Christ, just like the old covenant days of the Lord, in which God came, riding on the clouds, with the angels, with shouts, in flaming fire, destroying heaven and earth. I understood that the language of riding on the clouds of heaven signified deity. It indicated that God was at work. It indicated messianic identity, Daniel chapter 7. And it indicated judgment. You know, the coming on the clouds, folks, is almost invariably throughout the Old Testament a time of judgment. So whatever else we might think Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31 is about, the riding on the clouds of heaven is almost invariably referred to as a time of judgment, a time of messianic identity, a reference to the identity of God at work. Which means, by the way, that since it is the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, this is identifying Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords, as God. That is precisely why in Matthew 26, 64, when the Sanhedrin posed the question to Jesus, tell us plainly, are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? And Jesus said, I am, and henceforth you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And Caiaphas ripped his clothes and said, we have no further need of any proof this man has committed blasphemy. How was it blasphemy? Because they thought he was merely a man. They did not believe that he was God. And they knew, they understood that for him to claim that he was coming on the clouds of heaven meant he is God. What an incredibly powerful statement. 
So with all of that background, all right, with all of that background before us, Matthew chapter 24, 30 says, They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send forth His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. <clears throat> they will gather together the elect from the four winds of the heaven to the other, or from one end of the heavens to another. Now, tomorrow, I will begin examining this language of the coming with the sound of a trumpet. Got some homework for you. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 27. Now, I would like to recommend that you start with chapter 24 because Isaiah 24 through 27 is what is known as the little apocalypse. Scholars have recognized this for centuries. The New Testament writers quote, they cite, they echo, they allude to the little apocalypse over and over and over again in their eschatological predictions. In other words, the New Testament writers were looking for the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of Isaiah 24 through 27. All right? And by the way, pay particular attention in your doing your homework to all of the references to resurrection. Okay? Because tomorrow, I'm going to begin showing you that Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31 was a prediction of the resurrection. And that, ladies and gentlemen, changes everything, at least for the amillennialist and the postmillennialist, and I would suggest even for the dispensationalist. So it changes everything. I'll see you on the flip side.